Welcome back to Physics 371 Online. I'd like to discuss the physics of linear dielectric materials, where we get a little bit more insight into the phenomenon of polarization. Uh, polarization occurs, as you remember, when an electric field is applied to a dielectric material. And what happens is a response of the dipoles, or the atoms, inside the material uh, to generate a net dipole moment inside the material and macroscopically the dipole moment per unit volume is called the polarization. It makes sense just as we argued for the case of individual molecules that the polarization is a linear function of the applied field at least where the fields are small and so for historical reasons we usually make this approximation and we call the materials that obey it linear dielectrics we make the approximation as follows we say that the polarization is a linear function of the electric field. Uh, epsilon naught and then this constant chi uh, that we call the dielectric susceptibility are involved. Uh, P and E you see do not have the same units and that's why we have these constants out in front. Now, uh, just as an aside, it really would make more sense, at least to me, if we wrote P as a linear function of the electric displacement, or D. And that's because D represents the applied field. E, you'll recall, always represents the net field in our textbook. And so it would make more sense to define P in terms of D. However, this is the way it's been done historically, so we'll follow the historical convention. As I mentioned a moment ago, chi sub E is the dielectric susceptibility. And it has this name because it's really telling us to what degree this material is susceptible to being polarized. The larger chi is, the larger the polarization for a given electric field. Uh, chi depends on the details of the electronic structure of the dielectric. And uh, one question that you should ask yourself whenever a new quantity is defined is what, what are its units? I think you'll be able to see, if you look at this carefully, that P has the same units as the quantity epsilon naught times E. And so because of the way it's defined here, chi is a dimensionless quantity, which uh, then leads us very easily to realize that for a vacuum, chi should be zero, while for uh, for uh, empty space, then uh, chi should equal, uh, for, for empty space or for a vacuum, chi should equal zero. And as a result, uh, the, uh, the value of chi is just a pure number. So we can now write, if we go back to the definition of the electric displacement vector, and that should be a vector here, uh, d is equal to epsilon naught e plus p, so we're going to now substitute in for this class of materials that obey this linear approximation, we'll substitute in for p, and we get the epsilon naught e term, and now epsilon naught chi e, so if we factor out the e and the epsilon zero, we see that d can be written directly in terms of the net field, where chi is the material property of a particular dielectric material. So another way of writing this down, and I have to apologize for this, uh, textbooks have different ways of writing down this relationship between D and E depending on what kind of constants they want to define. But another way of doing this is to say that the displacement field D is equal to epsilon times E, where epsilon is defined to be epsilon naught times this factor 1 plus chi and epsilon is called the permittivity. You'll recall from your earlier physics textbooks that epsilon zero is called the permittivity of free space, which applies in the case of a vacuum, where, as I said before, chi would be zero. So for a vacuum, chi would be zero, and epsilon would be equal to epsilon naught, and that would be for free space. But epsilon is called the permittivity of the material. And there's even a third way of writing this down. We can define a new quantity, epsilon sub r, which is sometimes called the relative permittivity, uh, but epsilon not, uh, sorry, epsilon r is defined to be uh, 1 plus chi. So the quantity 1 plus chi is given its own name. Some textbooks call it epsilon sub r, some call it kappa, and it has the name, the dielectric constant. 
So these are just three different, completely equivalent ways of writing down the relationship between D and E using slightly different terms. And you should become familiar uh, with any of these because you're liable to run into one or more of those in uh, a different physics textbook. So uh, let's just take this new information about a linear dielectric and ask how does a linear dielectric affect the electric field that's applied to it? So if we apply an electric field to the dielectric, uh, what's the internal field going to be? Uh, and how is it related to the applied field? We have a pretty good feeling that the net field inside should be less than the applied field because the polarization is going to oppose the field that's being applied. But how much? So let's consider this model of a charged parallel plate capacitor. We have a parallel plate capacitor, we charge up the plates to plus and minus Q, and then we just write down E0 as the field that's present in the vacuum. You can see that the field always points from plus to minus. And the simple relationship between D and E is written like this. We can see, of course, that in the region in between the plates, which is empty, there's no polarization at all, so D is just epsilon naught times E naught. Simple relationship. Now let's consider the same capacitor where we insert a linear dielectric material, and we'll just say that it's got a dielectric constant of kappa. Okay, so uh, what's going to happen, we'll still have an electric field inside the dielectric, but it won't be the same as what it was in the absence of the dielectric. Epsilon or E0 and E are not the same. E is now the net field inside the dielectric. Somehow it's related to the applied field, but exactly how is it related? And we can just write down the same kind of relationship for D. It's epsilon naught E plus P. And with the linear expression for P, we can write this, as we did on the previous page, as kappa epsilon naught times E. Okay, now, how are these two equations related? Well, remember that D is produced by the free charge because D represents the initial applied field that's there because of these charges that we have deposited on the plates of the capacitor. So since D is due to them, the D values have to be the same in the two cases. So we just take these two expressions and set them equal to each other and then solve for the net field E. And E, we see, is simply E0 over K, uh, kappa. So kappa being a number greater than 1, it's equal to 1 for a vacuum, uh, but greater than 1 for uh, a normal material, we see that the electric field is less inside a dielectric than the applied field is. The dielectric, in other words, responds to the applied field by becoming polarized, which reduces the applied field the field inside now by a factor of kappa. And we'll use this simple result in working homework problems in your textbook involving dielectrics. It's a good thing to remember that when you have a linear dielectric material, what it does is reduces the field that's applied to it by a factor of kappa. Now, a couple of notes in closing this section. We can derive a really interesting relationship for linear dielectrics by going back to the definition of the bound charge density as minus the divergence of the polarization field. So now, for a linear dielectric, the polarization field can be written as epsilon naught chi times E. Then we can write E, as we did a couple of slides ago, as D divided by epsilon naught 1 plus chi and then collect the terms, we see that the epsilon naught cancels, and the chi over 1 plus chi, that's clearly a constant, so we can pull that outside of the divergence, and just write minus chi over 1 plus chi times the divergence of D. And the divergence of D, according to Gauss's law for dielectrics that we derived a few class periods back, del dot D is equal to the free charge density. And so, we have this very interesting relationship that says the bound charge, volume bound charge density, is equal to minus some constant times the free charge density. And what this is telling us then is for linear materials, this one special case, we can only have volume bound charge if some volume free charge exists. Okay, and so uh, there, there may occasionally be cases where we can find the volume free charge, and this is a bit of a shortcut to find the volume free charge.
bound charge if we know the susceptibility of the material. One last comment then about polarization in real materials. We defined, as you can see referring to the top of the slide here, we defined P as epsilon naught chi times E. And if you look at that, it kind of assumes that chi is simply going to be a constant. Uh, it actually assumes it would be a constant that would be the same no matter whether we're talking about the x, the y, or the z component of P, uh, the polarization vector. Uh, however, in real crystals, the susceptibility in general depends on the direction. In other words, it won't be the same for an applied field along the x direction as it is along the y direction or the z direction. And the most general case involves a matrix equation, where the three components of the polarization vector are related to the three components of the applied electric field, and they're related through these terms on a 3x3 three three matrix. They're all susceptibility terms, but we label them chi sub e xx, xy, xz, and so on. And rather than being a simple constant, as it might be the case for a material that's isotropic, that has the same properties in all directions in space, we now have something that's called the susceptibility tensor. A tensor quantity is one that uh, combines the dependence Let's say uh, if we wrote down what this would give us for P sub x, we could see that there would be a possibility of the x component of the polarization depending not only on the x component of the applied field, but on y and z terms as well. And in real materials, sometimes this happens. So that in general, uh, this susceptibility can't be written as a simple constant, but rather as a 3x3 three three, uh, matrix, which represents a tensor quantity. So. Uh, hopefully this is a useful introduction to the properties of linear dielectrics and in class we'll start to work on some examples and some of the homework problems. I'll see you there.